Wow, well the bin is overflowing at the front here. Please do take a seat. And Sandgate children, if you'd like to come and sit back on the carpet here, we have oh, we have All Saints Bunny, who is a bit of a celebrity in Sandgate School. Now you can play with him after church. If you go and sit on the carpet down there, everyone come down. Now, we, I know we're going to struggle um, to keep the children's uh, concentration because they can see the bouncy castle being inflated through the window outside. Oh. But um, All Saints Bunny, if you sit on the carpet down here, sit on the carpet. All Saints Bunny is going to look after all this food. So I'm going to sit him on top of the one can bin. Okay. And remember, because his ears are so big, you need to be very quiet because he's got very sensitive ears. So you know how much he loves coming into school? He loves it just as much when you come to his home, the church. Will you listen very quietly now as we listen to our reading, which um, two of the Sandgate children are going to read for us? The king of Egypt said, I had a dream last night, a strange dream, and I can't work out what it means. A dream, said his wine server. Yes, I'm very confused by it, replied the king. I don't know what it means. I know a man who can tell you all about your dreams, said the wine server. Let me fetch him for you. So the wine server went to fetch Joseph, who was in prison at the time. After he had put on clean clothes and had sorted his hair, Joseph was presented to the king. The king began to describe his dream. I was standing on the banks of the river, he began, when I saw seven fat cows walk out of the water. They were chewing happily on the grass when seven other cows joined them. These cows were, were bony and instead of eating the grass, they ate the first seven cows, but they stayed as skinny as ever. What can it mean? Joseph stood still listening to God. Then he bowed and said to the king, Your majesty, this is what the dream means. For the next seven years, Egypt will grow, grow many good crops and be as fat as those first cows. But after that, for another seven years, hardly any food will grow. So unless you want your people to look like those skinny cows, you must store up food in the good years and use it wisely later. The king was so impressed with Joseph's answer that he not only let him stay out of prison, but he also put him in charge of sorting and saving Egypt's food. Seven good years were followed by seven bad, just as Joseph had said. And after the king, Joseph became the most important man in Egypt. Wow, thank you so much. What brilliant reading. Do you want to sit just down here? So that was the story about Pharaoh being warned in a dream that there were going to be seven good years followed by seven bad years. And Joseph, with his advice to Pharaoh, saving the whole of Egypt. I think there are some mums and dads here who could do a very good Elvis impression and tell that story at the same time. Some people know what I'm talking about there. Now, did you know, we're thinking about this story of Joseph. It's actually a very contemporary story because Joseph was a refugee. He was trafficked, he was smuggled, he was kidnapped and taken from one country to another where he worked as a slave. And just as we see our television screens full now of people who are having to move from a country to another country that's strange to them, that they don't want to go to, that's exactly what happened to Joseph. And here's a thought... Joseph arrived in this country, spent a few years in prison, and then became prime minister. 
Can you imagine that? The media's full of people saying that the new leader of the Labour Party couldn't possibly be Prime Minister. Imagine if a Syrian refugee arrives in this country, serves a prison sentence, and then ends up in number 10. That's what happened. It's an amazing story. And I wonder why. What was it about Joseph that meant he could go from being a refugee in prison to becoming Prime Minister? Well, the answer is God's wisdom. God gave him wisdom to Pharaoh, uh, to tell Pharaoh what he had to do in response to his dreams. And this is what Joseph said to Pharaoh, you will have more than you need. He said, you will have, when these seven years of great crops come in, you will have more than you need, and so you have a choice. The choice is you can consume it all yourself, and that way will lead to death. Or you can share it all, be wise, steward it, look after it, and share it with other people, which will lead to life. What a contemporary message that is. God's wisdom, you have far more than you need. You can choose, are you going to consume it all yourself, or are you going to be wise and share it with others? They chose to share it with others. And we read later on in the story that almost the whole world came to Egypt and was saved because they had enough food to share with everyone. Now, I've got a video for us to watch now, which will tell us a little bit about sharing food around our world and how there is enough food for everything, but we need to share. Let's watch this. So that was a video produced by a charity called The Hunger Project, who do an amazing job of um, educating and us and changing our attitudes to food. You can go to their website, if you like, and have a look at it. And one of the things they said there is the great news that actually one of the biggest achievements, I think, that our world has made over the last 30 years is to reduce so drastically the number of people who are hungry. But there are still people who are hungry. And in this church, as many of you will know, we sponsor children in East India. Um, my wife Helen and I went out there earlier this year, and we are sponsoring children. And they focus, as that video did, especially on little girls and on giving them food and education and so on. And for £25 a month, we can change lives by doing that. Now, I've, got, um, I've been shopping too. Just to prove that it's not just Anna who goes to Sainsbury's. I've been to Sainsbury's as well, and I uh, need some helpers. So I'm going to ask Abby and Daisy and Grace and Lauren to come up here. And um, I bought some beans. Now, the good news, girls, is you're not going to have to eat all these beans, but I am going to ask you to stack them up. So each one of these beans, hang on one at a time, one at a time. We're going to start with Daisy, 
Okay, can you move back from the table? We're going to start with Daisy. Each one of these beans, if you're interested, if you're into nutrition, um, equates to 500 kilocalories per day. And this is how much we, on average, in this country, eat. I'm going to ask you, Daisy, to stack up, Daisy, Daisy, Daisy. to stack up seven of those tins. Three. Do you want to count with her? Four. Five. Don't worry about that. Six. Are you okay, Daisy? Getting a bit tall? Seven. Seven. Okay. Please stand back from the table because I don't want it to be knocked over. Okay. Now that represents the amount of food on average we eat in this country every day. Of course, I don't mean that we all eat seven tins of baked beans every day. That would be stupid. But that's how much we eat. Now, we do not eat the most of any country in the world. Who wants to have a guess which country eats the most food? And you four aren't allowed to take part. Oh. Who wants to guess? Who wants to guess? Lara? Uh, uh, America. America, right in one. Round of applause for Lara. Lara, stand up. Take a bow. Sit back down again. Okay, who's, who wants to guess how many cans we need to stack up to represent how much Americans eat? Yeah, let's see. Okay, that's cheating because you've heard it before. Yes, yeah, someone else? Anyone want to guess? How many? Yeah. Okay, you just heard one. Well, okay, right. How about if we ask Lauren to start stacking? Let's count, children, and I'll tell her when to stop. Okay? One. Two. Wait for it. Three. Four. Here's some more. I've been shopping again. There we are. Five. Okay, hang on a minute. Hands up if you think we're halfway there yet. Or not. Okay, hands up if you think it, the, the end result is going to be more than ten. Hands up if you think it's going to be less than ten. Hands up if you're just waiting for the bouncy castle. Okay, that's most of you. Yeah, all right. Okay, we'll speed up. We'll speed up. Okay, five... Six. There we are. Seven. Right, stop there. Stop there. Okay. Seven. And I have got a few beans here to represent half a can to put on top. Okay, move back, Grace, so everyone can see. Don't touch the table, please. They... Did you know that the equivalent, the average American, would eat seven and a half cans of beans? Is that surprising? It was to me. I thought it would be more than that. So the difference, Americans do eat more than, than we do on average significantly more, but only um, an extra half a can. So you might need to apologise to any Americans you know that you've been maligning. Right, so there we are. There's the UK, there's America. Now I thought, well, we sponsor these children in India... I wondered how much on average do people in India eat in a day? Anyone want to guess? How many cans do you think? Yeah? One? Point five? Five? Three? We have heard the right answer. Here it comes. Abby's going to stack this one. Should we count? One. Two. So it wasn't one. Three, four, keep going, five, surprised, again I was on average, on average this is how much Indians have to eat compared with Americans and with us, I stress on average because in India the, the gap between riches and poorage is perhaps the biggest anywhere on the planet, but I want you to look at these piles for a minute and imagine Imagine that this which is our pile, these two tins were taken away, so you were eating the same as in India. That would be like someone saying, coming to you and saying, you know your lunch, you're not going to have that anymore for the rest of your life. How would you like that? How would you like that? That is the way life is, on average, if you live in India. And the final one we're going to do, which is grace... We're going to do for Africa. So we also have a link church in South Africa. So I chose a country in Africa. I chose Zambia. And Zambians eat... Okay. Yeah. There we are. And one more. 
four. Now, thank you, girls. You can go and sit back down. Thank you very much. So, on average, and you've done some good stacking there, these tins might not be as different as you thought they would be, but part of that is because for the last 40 years, the gap, um, the number of people who are living in extreme hunger has been going down. But even so, we still, on average, we eat nearly twice as much as people who live in Zambia. Isn't that a sobering thought? Nearly twice as much. So we have a duty to think of them. And our faith calls us to think every time we have a meal. That's why so many Christians thank God for their food before every single meal, because they're remembering that it is all a gift from God. There is so much that we can do to affect this. With a food bank just around here, I mean, this food that is um, sitting here in front of us in this bin, it may not be saving lives, but we don't know. It might actually be saving lives. It's certainly doing something just in this area to reduce this inequality. Sponsoring children is another. We are doing something to help those who have nowhere to live. In November, um, I and several other people, including some others here, will be sleeping in a cardboard box in the church porch to raise money for Wickham Homeless Connection to support their work with the homeless this Christmas. You might, not, you might want to come and join us in a cardboard box, or you might not, but you might want to support the people who are doing that. Joseph's wisdom from God was that we have more than we need and we have a choice. Do we consume it all ourselves or are we careful with it and share it around? Just like Jesus, who came hundreds of years after him, he was persecuted unjustly. He was betrayed by those who were closest to him. And in Jesus' sake, uh, in Jesus' case, that cost him his life as he died on the cross. But then with Joseph, as with Jesus, they were raised to a place of supreme authority from where they could offer a rescue to everyone. So this harvest, I want to encourage all of us, and I guess I'm speaking especially to us grown-ups now, to respond to the responsibility that we have and to use this wisdom that God has given to share what we have and to give to others as God has given to us. Let's close our eyes for a moment and pray. And children, if you want to, you might like to lie down on the ground at this point and close your eyes. That's the way we pray sometimes in the church here. So just lie down, find a little space and lie down and we'll pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us so much we ask that you would help us this harvest to be very thankful and to use the wisdom you've given us to make choices that lead to life. Amen. Now we're going to continue praying and some of the Sandergate children are going to come and lead us in our prayers. So children, if you want to, you can stay lying there unless you're one of the ones who's going to pray. Verity, are you going to pray? Amazing God, thank you for all the fruits and vegetables and our harvest. Thank you for all the farmers who grow the crops and look after the animals. Help us to respect our environment and look after each other. Amen. Verity, thank you for leading us in those prayers. Well, now our service has nearly come to an end. We're going to have a final song now. So I'd like to invite um, Stuart and Martin and Andrew, our ukulele player, who's going to come to the front. During this song, we will be taking um, an offering. If you're visiting, please feel free to let this pass you by. It's our way of contributing week by week to the work of the church. So please stand and we'll sing together.
As we gather here week by week, we really do believe that God meets with us uh, when we all come together. And so I just want to end this service um, by encouraging you, if you have any needs in your own life, to just take a moment of quiet now to bring them to God. We have a prayer team here who will be at the front of the church who would love to pray with you. And they felt before the service that there's someone who has a breathing problem, that God wants to bless you this morning, that there's someone who's struggling with dyslexia, and, there are, um, and we feel maybe these might be children, also really struggling uh, with a new school. If you have anything that you would like us to pray with or for, we have a very great God as we've just been singing, and we would love um, to pray for you. So Father, we thank you for this time together. 
We thank you that you are closer to us than our own breathing. And we pray now that by your spirit, you would flood into our lives, that you would remind us of your love, and that you would meet us in our place of need. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to say an enormous thank you to Sandy Gate and to Miss Hall, head teacher, Mrs. Phillips, who does the music for coming. Should we give them another round of applause for all their singing? Um, if you came to Church with Children this morning, please make sure that they don't leave without you. Um, I think especially with the excitement going on in the churchyard, please do be safe with the children. If you came with Elsa and you've lost her as well, and I'm looking after her, um, so she'll be at the front of church here waiting. Um, there's tea and coffee being served over in the corner. Please do stay around. And if you want to join us for the barbecue and the family fun, we'd love to see you. God bless you. Goodbye. <laughs>